So yeah, so my talk is, um, you know, if you go back to the earliest days of, the, of, uh, of DevOps, right, operations was, a, uh, it was, you know, was gonna go extinct, right? We're not gonna need any more. It's gonna be no ops. It's gonna be it's an easy thing, right? In fact, a lot of the early conversations um, happened to be one of the organizers of the first DevOps days in the US, and it was like, give us root, right? That was the big, the big rallying cry. And then a little while later was, ah, not like that. Take it back, take it back. I don't, I don't, I don't want it. But after all this time, we've had all these, you know, new developments, and now we've got moving on to uh, cloud native and Kubernetes and platform engineering and SRE. Um, but fundamentally, if you go inside, you know, organizations, especially organizations that I call that have the history of success, right, have any sort of legacy they've accumulated, um, life's still pretty miserable. Every time you have to touch <laughs> operations, a certain amount of friction, misery, and kind of mud you gotta you gotta climb through. And you know, now that um, uh, you know, so many organizations are going to more of the you build it, you run it model where kind of everybody is now getting involved in operations. Um, you know, that mud's kind of spreading all over the place, right? And I'm an operations person by, uh, by originally by, uh, um, by trade. So, you know, I'm saying that it's one of these things where uh, the better you can diagnose fundamentally, why is that? Why is operations so hard? What are the things that always make it such a difficult thing? The better you are to improve it, right? And I think that's one of the big things about the DevOps movement in general was that it wasn't so much like you must do this, right? But as people sharing of experiences and having a common language and common kind of frameworks to think about the problems that has led everybody to, you know, to great uh, success. So hopefully uh, the point of my talk today is less about you should do this when it comes to operations, but more about, I'm gonna tell you some stories and also kind of talk about um, the, these various uh, forces that I've noticed that constantly uh, pop up and undermine folks operations. So I said before, uh, I'm Damon Edwards. Um, once upon a time, I was the managing director of a consulting company that really specialized in kind of the DevOps improvement back in the day and operations improvement uh, called DTO Solutions. Worked a lot of big enterprises. Out of that, founded a uh, software company called Rundeck. We have an open source project still thriving today. Um, but we sold the company to PageDuty about two years ago. Now I work at PageDuty, um, kind of helping to bring their whole portfolio of products to bear on bigger and bigger problems. Uh, also been heavily involved in the DevOps community since you know, the very before it was called uh, DevOps. Uh, my podcasting partner, John Willis, um, we called it the DevOps Cafe because he had gone to the first DevOps days in Ghent and was like, I don't know what's going on here, but there's something, something special. And then uh, we helped organize DevOps days for a while on the global scale, really focusing on Silicon, the, the US, and then um, also helped Gene Kim launch his DevOps Enterprise Summit conference. And the reason why I'm bringing all that up is I get to see inside a lot of companies. And that's, I think, uh, it's fun for me. I don't know if everyone would say that's fun, but I, I think it's fun. And so a lot of this is based on uh, what, I've, what I've seen. So let's start with the story, right? Um, story time here, right? Imagine clear your minds. Uh, so it's Thursday inside this company. This is a, by the way, all the names have been changed to protect the not so, the not so innocent. Um, we'll just call this a healthcare related, uh, related company. So it's Thursday about 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, the call center agents, I have 1,200 call center agents, start noticing, wow, like our, our applications are all seizing up, right? They'd moved to a distributed call center, mostly distributed. I think about half and half were at home, half were in the actual call centers. Uh, things are getting slow, right? And occasionally getting timeouts, and there's a problem. Customers are starting to notice things on their end for the customer service side of things. Um, and you know, the customers are complaining through the call center agents. They're, that's spiking their increased load. The VIP customers, right, they get to go directly to the technical support team that normally the call center has to call. They have to then uh, go on to the, the service desk team, and all they're seeing is kind of stuff is, stuff is slow. But of course, the whole time they're looking, the status pages, the roll-up of all the monitoring that they get to see, it looks green. But I'm getting all these complaints of things being slow. I guess I'll file this. Looks like about a P3 type, uh, type bug. But then suddenly at 3.30, boom, you know, it's, uh, it's back to normal. Everybody's... Happy, that was weird, right? So the service desk is like, well, you know, status is closed, they have this to be investigated label. Um, of course, they kind of realize nobody ever investigates it, but you know, it's still good housekeeping to mark it as some kind of resolution. So next morning, right? This time it's about 10 a.m., right? Same, same thing, thing starts happening. The call center agents, this is looking slow, what's going on here? The customers are like, what's wrong with these people? How hard is it to run a website? We all know it's easy, right? And uh, customers are complaining, Service desk, what do they see? It's all green, right? This time they're like, not gonna be fooled this time. Um, you know, we're gonna escalate and I'll put a higher priority on it. Um, you know, the incident commander kind of starts in with a, well, why? Why'd you put this priority on it? Is this really that big of a deal? Um, and then they're like, no, we're getting these complaints and they started, you know, starting to count the volume of, of complaints. 
And they said, okay, let's launch the, um, a minor incident bridge, right? And um, so, you know, the on-call message goes out, uh, start the bridge call, um, you know, 30 minutes later or so, they start poking around. Um, finally, one of the SREs notices that, <clears throat> excuse me, it looks like something with one of the legacy um, account viewing components, right? They had acquired a bunch of companies, they had some services, um, and uh, they weren't working so well. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> the whole time, Dev is saying, hey, you know, we uh, haven't made any code updates. I don't know what that would be. Some folks said, I thought we still retired those components. We still use them. And then one of the platform security people was like, oh, thank goodness. You know, I didn't think, I didn't think it was the new uh, server hardening or network changes. And of course, <coughs> everyone's like, sorry, I'm coughing here. Everyone's like, what? You know, what new server hardening and, and, and uh, process and network changes? Excuse me. <coughs> sorry. So he uh, said, well, yeah, we're going to fail the audit. You didn't get the email. We had to make these, uh, these changes. So in that case, they, they assembled the war room. They noticed these legacy components that, of course, you know, they were going to retire them, right, any, any, any moment. So they didn't bother to do a lot of the new telemetry and logging um, and, you know, uh, metrics and uh, the monitoring tools that they had for other parts of the, of the new infrastructure. So the theory is in the, the war room that, hey, this is this new uh, security updates. The war room gets up to about 30 people at its peak. Everyone's trying to figure out which of these security updates could be causing this problem. Of course, the call center manager finds their way into the bridge call, starts going, what's, you know, what's going on? Old time developers are like, hey, we didn't change anything. We're not showing up, right? And uh, suddenly, 2.30, boom, the thing works, right? So they realize, hey, it probably has something to do with the system load, East Coast, West Coast, coming on, on board and off board. Uh, but it's Friday afternoon. The VP of operations is like, we can't let this go on, and on further. Um, sorry, folks, we have to work on the weekend. We've got to roll back these changes. Got to get rid of the platform changes, the network changes, take it back to where it was. Now, at the same time, VP of engineering is like, well, that's their problem, so it's not our problem. So they didn't, the, still had a, a small QA organization. The, the whole development team, they're like, well, you don't have to do anything this weekend. Enjoy your, enjoy your weekend. So they're off having beers and playing tennis and doing whatever they, they like to do. Well, you know, the poor suffering ops folks are, are digging in, right? So. It's Monday morning, right? 11 a.m. Everyone's like, oh, God, here, here we go again, right? So it's slow. Customers say you stink. Everybody's calling in. Of course, it's all green. But this time, we're ready. We got the war room assembled. Everybody's going to do this. And hey, we bring in the, um, one of the lead devs from the customer systems team. Of course, we try to get them in, send them emails, not answering. They're in the middle of their sprint. They sit in the cool new building with all the new, nice, nice, uh, nice office space because they're on a DevOps team, right? And uh, so, they, so finally, the incident commander literally goes over there. It's a true story. And says, uh, hey, you know, do you see this ticket we're sending you? And they're like, OK, I'll, fine, I'll take a look. So finally, he said, hey, it looks like something's wrong with the database response. I don't know. We didn't write these services. They came with the legacy stuff. In fact, I thought we had, we had uh, retired those. But our code didn't change. So you know, it's why bother me? The DBA is like, well, there's no recent, recent database changes either, right? So new theory for the war room, right? Still there, 30 people get strong. Uh, it's the database connection, right? So we're going through this, and of course, boom, as soon as they start looking at that, the load comes off, everything's back to, uh, back to green. Tuesday morning, you guessed it, I'm just gonna condense it now because everyone's doing the same thing. It's all green, war room. They've worked late into the night and saying, hey, I think there's something to do with these stored procedure calls. We can't figure out what it is. Um, it turns out they only bought, this is a multi-billion dollar public company, they only bought the bronze support for the database vendor, right? So they're not, the, the call center's not really helping them. They go to vendor management, they're like, that's what our contract says. So they put an emergency request to pay to have it upgraded to gold, had it bounce around. Luckily a VP actually knew somebody at the, uh, high up at the database vendor, said fine, we'll do it on spec, we'll send somebody out, uh, you know, for you in the, uh, the morning. So load comes off in the evening, it happens again the next day, it's now Wednesday. It started on Thursday the day before, right? And the vendor consultant comes in and says, hey, let's take a look at this. And everyone's just now just stopped, just going, what's, this, what's gonna happen, right? And the person comes back an hour or so later and is like, hey, well, this new performance analysis feature um, that was version three or four versions ago um, was finally toggled on, right? It's a metrics uh, <coughs> service. And even the DBA was like, so? It's like, well, it's choking on a particular store procedure that you seem to use everywhere for these services. And it's, uh, we've never seen this before, but it's got 500 parameters and over a million lines of code packed into that stored procedure. And half the people are like, the what? I'm sorry, say that again? And there half the people are like, ah, oh, it's worked for years, right? This is very portable, it's a great thing we, uh, we do, right? 
So it's like, ah, so, you know, well into the night, we um, do, some, they do some config changes to get rid of that flag, set it back to normal, do some load testing. They'd figured out in the meantime how to write some extra load testing. And it seems like everything is going to work. And it did, right? <laughs> so what goes on next, you know, you'll, you'll laugh if you don't cry, is the vendor consultant's like, yo, you should really fix that, right? It's probably not a good thing to have. Um, and the officers are reminding, hey, we just turned it off. We didn't actually fix this problem. What's the chance that someone's not going to, you know, that, that, that flag's not going to be magically turned on at some point in the future? We've got to refactor this before it bites us again. But, you know, um, the bug just gets closed, right? And uh, so the VP of Ops is like, hey, to VP of Dev, hey, I heard bug 8543, it's P1 to us, like, but it was rejected, right? And so on the dev side of the house, they're saying, hey, their change broke it. Right? We don't have time for this. We're going to retire these services someday anyways. Um, it goes up to the, uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm, whoops, going backwards here. Um, it goes up to you know, the GM, the line of the business, and the director of finance. Like, it's like, there's no budget here. Like, we're, not, we're not going down this path. So the VP of dev just says, hey, it's not a bug. You already have a fix. Closed. We're moving on. Right? You know, sad, sad trombone sound. Right? And then on top of that, this is the crazy part. When we came in and started going through this, uh, this incident, you add it all up, uh, the response labor was something like $200,000. The call center productivity was $620,000, right? So that's a grand total of like, I can point to the cost of $845,000. Press project delays, that's a lot of people in these war rooms, lost you know, basically a full week. Uh, brand damage, right? Like customers aren't happy. Highly regulated industry. Also, regulatory risk. It's easy to say this is over a million dollar incident. But if you walked around the executive halls and you're like, hey, do you remember that time we lost a million dollars you know, uh, last month, right? And there were two months ago, I mean, it was two months at the time. And they're like, no, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember there's some complaints about the call center being slow, right? And nobody kind of knew. What, so it's, we call it the million dollar incident that nobody, nobody knew, right? And so, you know, you ask, like, well, how do they end up here, right? It's easy to throw stones at these folks. Like, come on, how, you know? Do better, right? But you think about their organ. This is actually the organizational chart, right? And uh, you know, it was built through acquisitions, merger, success. They were a successful, successful company, right? And they weren't sitting still. They were trying all the new stuff, right? They were had DevOps teams. They were doing SRE work. They had cloud engineering. They started platform engineering. Um, uh, they were, you know, bringing the QA into the, into the development teams. But every time they went and tried to do anything, it was through this same kind of waterfall process, right? Corporate planning, annual budgets, project plans, requirements getting blown out through the organization, added in layers of program managers, lower, you know, organization uh, layers of change control, became a you know a mess, right? And people are asking, well, you know, what what is going on here? How do we how do we fix this, right? And part of it was just understanding, like I said, the systemic forces that undermine operations. And there's really kind of come to document really six of them, right? And so I'll kind of go through them and actually tell another, uh, another story. Uh, first one's low trust, right? And this is an interesting concept because think about most organizations, where are decisions made, right? Um, you know, you think about the people on the, uh, the left here, right? The, you know, the closest to the problem or the closest to the concept, you know, they have the most context, but the people all the way over here, right? That's the ones who are where those decisions are are, are made, right? And if you don't say, well, those are the people that have the most seniority or the most, you know, kind of experience here or they have the most at stake for the decision. Um, but, you know, John Alspa, um, kind of a former famous operator and now um, uh, a researcher in, you know, safety sciences and operational performance, makes a great point that, you know, he says things like, hey, this, you know, he does his conferences. How many people think this is dangerous, right? This looks pretty dangerous, but it kind of makes you pucker up a little bit, like, ooh, right? But then he goes, you know, but what if I tell you this is just a little routine that we run on some cash to clear it, right? They're like, oh, okay, not so dangerous anymore, right? And then he's like, is making this change, lowercase k to uppercase k, right? Is that dangerous, right? And most people go instinctively, no, right? It's a comment, right? But what if he learned out that the that's what the load balancer reads, right? That's the message it reads. Now suddenly it's dangerous, right? So, you know, the key point here is that the answer is it always depends, right? So all work we do in our fields is contextual, right? But if all the context is in the people over here, and then all the decisions are four or five, you know, six degrees away over here, you know, we have this big break in the gap, right? So we have this low trust problem where the people with the highest trust are the people with the least context, and the people we trust the least are the people that have the most context by what we're trying to fix. So low trust is a huge organizational um, uh, force, right? 
Next one is silos, right? And people say, oh, we talk about silos all the time and kind of gets conflated with teams, right, or functions. But the reality is like, what is a, a, what is a silo, right? What makes it, it, it difficult? And if you think about it, you're doing your work, right? You've got your backlog, you've got your priorities, you've got some context, like the current you know, information of where you're at, and you've got your tools, right? And for you doing your work, you're in your group, and if you have a small group, you add a few more folks, right, it's easy to share those things. Same backlog, same priorities, same kind of general context you're sharing, and you're probably using the tools the same way. But the problem is nothing in an organization lives in a silo, especially an organization of any size. So what happens is you always need something from somebody else, right? And that's where these silo forces start to develop because we've got these gaps. It's often either a knowledge gap, right? I couldn't, I, you know, I just don't know the current context to be able to do that for myself. Or it's a skills gap, like I'm not a network engineer. I don't really know all the ins and outs here. You need to do it for me. Or just an access gap. I could do it if I could get to it, but I can't because this, this wall that we've put up for compliance reasons or just you don't, don't want me mucking around your playground, whatever it is. So now I need to turn everything into, into a request and these silo forces start to, to start to evolve. And we work that way via those requests like that, people start to turn inward. They optimize for their job, for the, whatever it says on their card at the end of the day, that's what they're gonna optimize and make sure it gets, gets done. And these mismatches start to form, right? So you know, there's context mismatches. We just see the world a little bit differently, right? Our information is differently. There's process mismatches, right? We just do things a little bit differently. There's tooling mismatches. Often we'll see the exact same tool in different parts of the organization, just used in different ways. Like that little trick we heard earlier uh, from uh, this uh, uh, woman down here that said about the adding the, adding the TF, right, to the, uh, you know, the con that convention, right? This, these same tools, just used a little bit differently. And then this starts to form capacity issues, right? Where we have only so many people over here, a lot of people over here. So all these disconnects and mismatches really start to build all these problems between, um, between these silos. Which then brings us to the next force, which is ticket queues, right? So how do we cover for all those disconnects and mismatches, right? Well, this easy thing, right? We get a ticket queue, drop it in the middle. It's gonna be great. It's gonna broker all the communication back and forth in a nice orderly way. But come on, we all know how well that actually actually works, right? The, miscorrect, the misconnections, lost in queues, you gotta go get somebody who knows somebody to pay somebody off to get your thing up to the top and then you get it, it's never right, and you gotta send it back and they don't know what you're talking about anymore, right? You know, the fun and joys of working through, through queues. And, but there's, you know, what do queues do to you, right? First of all, we spend all this work, we talk about value streams, right? And seeing the end-to-end -end system. But then we take that picture and we blow it up and throw it into a bunch of queues, right? And all that's doing is now obfuscating, um, you know, the value streams. Right? and also undermining the cohesion of the system because we're just working on these individual bits and pieces of it, that knowledge is now lost. And if you look to other fields, right, there is actually a lot of, uh, there's science behind this, there's, there's physics, there's math behind this. Um, Don Reinertsen, who has this incredible book, The Principles of Product Development Flow, um, it's funny because you read it, you think, you think you're reading a technology book and then you realize, oh no, I'm reading a, just a product book, right? It doesn't do with technology. Um, at all, but it talks about that there's these you know, kind of proven costs of working through queues and other fields, manufacturing and whatnot, they know all about this, right? That you know, queues create longer cycle times, obviously, gotta put it in a queue, gotta wait, increased risk, because we're now breaking up that work and things, the longer the, the time duration goes, the greater the risk, more variability, right? Because you're losing the context, you get a lot of like kind of one-off snowflakes working through queues. More overhead, we gotta manage these things. Lower quality because actually the sum of all those things before that. And then the fascinating one they proved is less motivation. That, that when humans see your work go into a void and it never gets fulfilled or it comes back slower later, people intrinsically lose motivation, right? They lose that, they lose that connection. So all of these costs are what we're introducing when we use queues as a way to cover for those disconnections between, uh, between our different silos. And uh, another, actually, if you're interested in the, the physics and math of these things, uh, Scott Pru, um, a link to it here has a great uh, accounting versus physics. It looks into all the math behind this. But queues get ugly really fast, right? That there's this classic formula of wait time. How long you're going to wait is the percent busy divided by the percent idle, right? And as you see, like from this you know, chart here, this all seems great at low utilization, but starts to quickly double and then exponentially kind of explode the wait time as queues build, uh, get closer to capacity. And you all know how this goes, right? Like, they all say build slack time into your work, right? But if you're in a, in a queue-driven sort of operations world, you know that thing is always pegged to the maximum. The wait times go through the roof. So we're introducing all this wait time and kind of destructive forces to our organizations. So um, silos, 
you know, um, cues, uh, um, uh, what's the first one I said? Low trust, right? Huge issues. But before we talk about the next three, let's do another story. You guys want to know a story? Um, so this one, now we're, let's not look at an incident. Let's look at just actual, we consider like project work, but unplanned project work, right? Um, another thing that comes into the operations world all the time, right? So for example here, hey, we've got this new partner program. This is a financial services company, um, large one. They have this new partner uh, program where they get partners to send transactions through their service or to their service. And uh, you know, this person got excited. They're like, hey, this is great. Our company's gonna do this. Um, and uh, they go to the partner operations team and they said, oh great, we'll get you set up with the test APIs. You can then you know, integrate your service to that and then we can get up off and running. So the partner's a little bit miffed. They're like, hey, it's 2023. Can't this thing be automatic? But I understand you know, things uh, aren't always fully automated. So the partner team has their own uh, dedicated technical lead. You know, she gets the ticket and says, hey, okay, give me some details. They go back and forth over you know, Slack and, and phone and whatnot. And then, and it finally comes up with, okay, you know, I can do the service config part, right? But I got to get the SRE to the environment set up. I got to get the DBA team to populate with the latest test data for the region. And I got to get the NetSec team to open up the next ports to the DMZ uh, firewall for that uh, API. And under her breath, she's like, oh, whew, okay, here we go again. Like, you know, I'm about to dive into the, uh, the mud and start crawling, right? Because she knows I got to go through all these queues. I got to open all these tickets for these different teams who have their own priorities, their own things going on, right? So the first path is the SRE team. Now, of course, they've got all their other tickets going on, emergencies, you know, new things rolling out, right? So finally, she gets up to the top of the uh, top of the queue, and it, they, you know, get back there and said, "Hey, an environment already exists for this account name, right?" So now she's got to say, "Oh, wait, that's a different old subsidiary. We can blow that environment away. They got to get approval from a sales manager in order to to do that. Uh, that gets done." And then it sprung on, it's like, wait, we got a new intake process, right? So now you're gonna have to you know, fill out this spreadsheet, not the old spreadsheet, it's got a bunch of data in it. So she goes back and forth, fills that out, more waiting, more back and forth. And so finally, the SRE team, they can apply their little Terraform, Terraform and Ansible magic and spin up the environment. And in the meantime, you know, the DBA team, uh, the data team, they sprung fast, they're like right away, they're like, boom, what do you need, it's done, right? And then, but of course, as time went on, um, the partner team tech lead here, she realized, oh, wait a minute, like this is the wrong data. This is for the EU, not for the US. So she's got to reopen the ticket. That person had actually moved on to a different team in the meantime, it was like a week later. And so now they got a new person responding, like, hey, can you catch me up? Let me know what's going on here. So they got to go through the back and forth and back and forth. So finally there's some, you know, some, some PowerShell action took place and uh, they got it done. Um, also at the same time, right, that early on in the meantime was, the NetSec team uh, took their ticket and got all mad, right? Because they're like, this environment doesn't even exist. Like, you violated our process, right? And she's like, I'm sorry, I'm waiting for the SRE team. And they're like, all right, well, you know, leave us alone. And then when you finally get all that stuff set up, then you got to get your request in by a Wednesday. And then the following Monday, we'll do the updates and, and so forth. So now, of course, the partner team gets lead busy with other things. They miss a week because they've missed that, that cycle. They remember to do this, they reopen the ticket, had to go through an approval process, and they finally got it got it done, right? So it was literally, you know, something that you think would be uh, a few easy steps on the keyboard ends up being weeks worth of work spanning, you know, a dozen, a dozen people across multiple teams. And the whole time, the problem is, you know, the, that partner was like at first gung-ho saying A plus B equals lots of money, right? Let's go, let's do this. Then it becomes the status. Then it becomes a crisis of confidence, right? Of like, hey, does this, is this, do you folks have what it takes to even, to even work with us, right? So another sad... Sad tale, right? So, you know, going back to our forces that undermine uh, operations, uh, the next one on my list here is toil, right? And toil is a really relatively new, well, it's been around for a while, the concept, but finally there's a name for it that I think is one of the best uh, things about the SRE um, movement is really kind of, uh, it brought this idea to the, uh, to the world. And I love their definition. It was in that book that just gave away the SRE book. You've got it there. So ask him if you want him to, to read it to you. But they said, uh, this guy Vivek Rao wrote the chapter on toil, right? It says, toil is the kind of work tied to running a production service that tends to be manual, repetitive, automatable, tactical, devoid of enduring value, and scales linearly as the service grows, right? And really those last two pieces are key. I mean, the, the concept of, hey, stuff that could be automated should be automated. Why don't we automate it? That's a pretty obvious thing. But this concept of like devoid of enduring value, right? People get kind of wrapped around that. They're like, well, if I didn't do this, the business would go out of, out of, out of, um, out of, uh, out of business. But 
it's true, that's helping, but it's not actually moving the business forward. It's not, we're not adding enduring value to the business. And also, this is a very key question is, you know, hey, say we're at 1,000 of whatever today, dollars, transactions, customers, whatever it is, um, and we suddenly jumped up to a million, right? Or even a billion, right? Would the amount of labor we need to run this service scale linearly with that, right? That's a, a sign of there's a lot of toil in the system, right? Um, and so it's a very interesting way to look at your work, to say, hey, you know, we could kind of divide into two buckets. There's, there's toil, and the opposite of toil is engineering work, right? And I thought these characteristics were also great, like that toil it lacks the enduring value. It's not moving the business forward. Maybe necessary, you might be saving the day, but you're not actually moving the business forward. Um, whereas the engineering work, it builds that enduring value. It's things we do to move the business forward. You know, toil tends to be rote, repetitive. Engineering work takes creativity, right? It's iterative, it builds on itself, it's going somewhere. You know, versus tactical, versus strategic. Um, increases with scale, right? Versus engineering work actually enables scaling, right? And can be automated versus it requires human creativity, right? I think that's one of the great litmus tests. Like, assuming we have the time to do it, could we, could we automate it? Probably toil. If we, if we can't automate it because it needs human creativity, it's probably going to be considered engineering work, right? And why this is so critical, uh, especially for all in the operations world, is that excessive toil prevents us from fixing the system, right? So if you think about it, toil as this like kind of equilibrium, right? Toil and engineering work. When your toil is at a man manageable percentage of capacity, right, you have enough engineering time to do two things. One, further reduce toil, right, keep it at bay. And the other is take the rest of it and improve the business, right? So you're kind of at this nice equilibrium where we can move forward. But what happens in a lot of organizations is what I'd call engineering work bankruptcy, right? The toil crowds out that engineering work, and now as an organization, right, we don't have the capacity to improve the business, and we can barely keep our heads above water. We don't have enough capacity to even fight back against that, against that, uh, that toil. And that's when we effectively have this downward spiral. And you see a lot of operations organizations suffering from that. It's like the everyone's busy. Everyone's running 120%. We don't doubt that, that everyone's working hard, but nothing's getting done, right? We aren't moving forward as a business. It's a chronic complaint that you hear about operations teams. And often it's because they aren't given the resources or the protection, right? That no one's looking at us and saying, what is that balance between engineering work and toil? If we tip out of balance there we're towards that bankruptcy, we have to invest in or swarm to, you know, saving that team, right? Helping them fight back that toil um, to create more capacity for the engineering work. So, um, and the next kind of uh, force that comes up a lot here, right, is coordination costs, right? And this is an interesting one because it's kind of like, ah, collaboration, right? But if you kind of look on the academic research side, the folks that study like, you know, nuclear submarines, aircraft, you know, uh, flight operations, uh, um, you know, healthcare, right, operating rooms, any kind of high consequence um, domain where operations really, you know, makes it makes makes it makes a difference. This notion of of uh, coordination costs is what's the friction it takes to to get work done, especially across uh, across multiple multiple people, right? And there's, you know, it kind of still lives in the academic world, right? There's some uh, there's a great Laura McGuire who um, did a a whole thesis for Ohio State on um, coordination costs and large scale distributed software systems. Uh, does a great job of pointing to all these uh, all this research about that, and it's really fascinating to how humans think and communicate. And the definitions start a little bit kind of eggheady, right? Like the cost of maintaining communication links or channels between actors and costs of exchanging messages over those links. A little kind of hard to repeat in a team meeting, right? Or, uh, you know, coordination cost refers to the burden on joint action participants that is due to choreographing their efforts. Fair enough, not bad. My favorite one is, you guys know Gene Kim, right? Who's the uh, author of The Phoenix Project. He's uh, writing a new book with Steven Spear, who's the uh, famous MIT professor. And they just leave it as, how many people do I have to talk to? And how many levels above me do I have to go, right? And if you can measure those two things, you can know what is the coordination cost in your organization. On average, how many people do I have to talk to to do anything? And then when I'm talking to those people, sort of how many levels do I have to, uh, to go up? And our good friend, Scott Prue, um, actually uh, that same presentation I was talking about, really dug into, uh, found some other kind of mathematical sort of physics-based proof um, talking about uh, the coordination costs, right? And really focused in on handoffs, right? Because that's a very, a very ta tangible thing you can look at in your organization is how many handoffs do I need to do to get some logical unit of work, um, of work done, right? And um, two really important formulas he kind of stumbled across here, right? One is 
um, one that Troy McGinnis kind of as uh, was a famous agile um, theorist, I guess you'd call him, talks about coordination risk, right? In any, in any activity, the number of handoffs you add, each handoff you add effectively um, cuts your odds of success in half, right? So the formula is one in, you know, two to the end, right? So, you know, the risk, if you, uh, the risk of one handoff, you basically have a 50% chance that something's gonna, gonna go well, right? But if you run it out to six handoffs, you have a one in 64 chance that things are gonna go well, right? I mean, there's gonna be no cost of delay. And it could be not that there's an error, it could be just uh, we had to do things out of sequence, we had to um, you know, change an API, we had to change where things, something had to change, right, that's gonna impact some other team. And the more handoffs you have, there's actually math behind this um, that you know, every, so every handoff you can remove, you're basically improving your odds of success of not having some sort of some sort of delay, um, you're cutting it in half, you're improving it by 50%, right? So uh, it's a pretty powerful concept. And at the same time, uh, Mary Poppendiek, another person from the kind of agile lean world, um, talked about tacit knowledge, right? That there's a lot of research out there that shows that how much knowledge do people lose as they as things hand off? And there's knowledge that comes with the things, so documentation, and whatnot. But they're talking about the tacit knowledge, right? The things you just know by working on on that thing. And it starts at obviously 100% work in yourself and then effectively kind of cuts in half from there, right? So one hand off, we're talking about 50% uh, of that knowledge is still there. But six hands off, six, six hands offs or five hand offs is down to three, you know, two, uh, one uh, uh, percent, right? And it kind of goes with that also that folklore that if you're ever more than three degrees away from the person doing that work, you really don't have the knowledge of what's, of what's, um, of what's going on, right? So coordination costs become very expensive and you know, not only thinking about the communication pathways, but also you know, um, the uh, uh, the risk that you're that, that we're incurring, particularly around um, around handoffs. So very interesting concept that's uh, emerging and to keep a keep an eye on. And the last one is unplanned work, right? So unplanned work um, is all of the um, things that didn't fit in, in, in the project plan, right? It's definitely work that's uh, that's often hidden, right? So it could be incidents, it could be um, uh, you know, just the stuff in a project like, hey, can you help me with this? Or would you mind taking a look at that? Or that thing you, you always do so well, can you do it again for me, right? You know, all these interruptions that, um, that, that pile up. And we think about the headline ones, right? And especially at PageDuty, you think about things like incidents, right? Um, but, you know, there's really, that's just one sliver of all the unplanned work that folks have to deal with. And, um, you know, there's plenty of research out there that shows things like, you know, organizations lose 15 to 28% of their capacity due to unplanned operations work. These are enterprises at, at scale, like more than, more than 1,000 1, people, right? Um, and you know, there's this great, speaking to Gene Kim earlier, there's this great quote from the Phoenix Project where they say, you know, unplanned work is what prevents you from doing the needed planned work, right? Like matter and antimatter. In the presence of unplanned work, all planned work ignites with incandescent fury, incinerating everything, everything around it, right? And it's one of these things where, especially in the operations side of the house, we just kind of think, well, that's the way it is, right? This is ops, right? And in ops, it's like, well, it's probably one of the few places in business where, you know, planned and unplanned work is actually just part of the job description, right? On the dev side of the house, it's like we have the luxury of locking this stuff out, right? It's, hey, we got this sprint. You can't bother us. We're, you know, we're locked in here, right? Operations side of the house, kind of no such, um, no such, no such luck. And in, I think it also leads to how folks um, in sort of dev versus ops think about the world, right? You talk to uh, you know, a lot of developers and they see things very deterministically, right? You write the code and it either works or it doesn't, right? It either compiles or it runs or it doesn't, right? And if it doesn't, you can unpack why. It's complicated, but you can figure it out, right? It's a very deterministic uh, view of the world. You poke that or push that, you know what happens on the other side. Whereas you come on the operation side of the house, um, it's like this seemingly endless stream of of, of um, seemingly impossible failure scenarios, right? Um, Charity Majors, the CEO of Honeycomb, likes to, t to talk about that, that you talk to folks at Facebook or at, at, at Netflix, right? Or J. Paul Reed, another person at Netflix talks about this, that they've spent billions, literally, on availability and reliability. And they're like, we don't have less incidents, less problems, we have weirder incidents, right? Stranger things happen. It's like these, the Swiss, these multiple layers of Swiss cheese just line up perfectly once in a millennia, and that's the outage, right? So, um, you know, lots of think that, hey, this is just part of the, uh, you know, part of the job. And there's a lot of, actually, going back to the academic research, a lot of um, uh, 
Studies have looked at this in you know, anywhere from 30, 50, sometimes 70%, depending on what they're measuring, of, of organizations' time goes to this unplanned, um, unplanned work. And you know, why this is so important to think about, well, how do we counteract it? We can't, we can't stop it, right? But why do we need to counteract it? Because you know, it's, the un, it's the fuel, the gasoline, that, that, that really uh, you know, uh, flames, uh, stokes the flames of all of those other uh, problems we're talking about. It makes the silos worse, it makes the toils, toil obviously worse, um, it exasperates those, those ticket queues, it drives the coordination costs through the roof because you always have to find different people to, to do things and they were at, working in a different context, and it ruins trust, right? So, you know, unplanned work, another critical thing to look at because of that, um, that dysfunction, right? So, it's uh, kind of back to this again. So again, low trust, silos, ticket queues, toil, coordination costs, unplanned work, right? Find that, you know, in going into an organization and be able to talk about this and socialize those concepts, it's very similar to the early DevOps conversations about flow and about handoffs and about automation, right? It was like, these are the things we want to be able to talk about and understand and diagnose kind of what's going on in our um, organization. So I think it's a very useful formula. So some example countermeasures. Um, you know, uh, the first one, you know, socialize these concepts and standardize the vocabulary, right? Be able to talk in your organization about that, right? Be able to look at the problems you have and say, ha, ah, this is, you know, because of the silos or this is because of the ticket queues or this is because of the coordination costs, right? Being able to talk about these problems is a, a huge step forward to be able to say, okay, now let's actually figure out what to, to do about. Um, eliminating handoffs wherever possible. Again, remember those coordination cost issues, the knowledge loss issues, um, just the, the ability to get things home without, without, um, without delay. Wherever you can remove those handoffs, we're talking about a, you know, a, uh, a doubling of our, of, our, of our odds. So very effective for you know, getting rid of the silo issues, the, uh, uh, the you know, ticket queue issues, the coordination costs. Um, and sometimes these are simple organizational process changes. Those are easier. Just say, hey, let's stop doing this on two teams. Let's put them together. Or let's change the process so we don't have to have this, this handoff or whatever it might be. Um, of course, that often leads to architectural discussions, and that's obviously a much bigger and longer um, conversation. And then the idea of uh, distributing operational responsibility with guardrails, right? I think you see a lot of the you build it, you run it um, uh, ideas going this direction, right? To say that, hey, we need to be able to, to distribute operational control, but also you know, maintain uh, those centralized controls. Really helps with you know, the trust issues, number one, you know, silos, breaking down silos, keeping things out of queues, right? How we keep queues we need just for you know, what they're supposed to be for, the emergencies, how can we keep as much as possible out of those things? And uh, lowering those coordination costs. Um, platform engineering, how many folks are doing like some kind of platform engineering thing in their organization? Yeah, see that's the new. And were you doing SRE before? Yep, yeah, it's the new, uh, the new, the new, new. Um, but same concept, it's like how do you build self-service operations, right? How do you enable people to do the things that they need to do without having to escalate to a subject matter expert, right? Or worse, the platform team becoming the support organization for everybody, for everybody else, right? And then um, automated diagnostics and health checks, right, is another one that uh, is, a, is a key countermeasure here because, you know, a big problem is people aren't sharing the same context. They're trying to look at something and say, well, what is, what am I trying to change here? What is, the, what is the issue I'm trying to deal with? And each part of the organization will have a different way to look at this, right? A different way to say, oh, how do I know this is healthy? Or how do I know what the current, the current state is, right? So organizations, we see that focus on building that common view of how are things currently configured? How are things currently running? How would I tell if this thing is healthy or, or not? The more they can kind of standardize or, or at least get alignment around those ideas, the faster they can move, the less, you know, they keep stuff out of queues, the coordination costs are way lower. Um, a lot less toil, um, and also helps a lot with f fighting the unplanned, the unplanned work. And then last, um, you know, self-service, those uh, automating service requests, right? So things that aren't uh, incidents, the rest of your work, right? How do you make it so you're creating as many self-service uh, interfaces as possible so people can stay out of um, the queues, right? And uh, this is often great where you can't get rid of those handoffs, right? So the first steps could be like, well, let's get rid of this handoff. And if we can't do that, how do we turn it into a self into a into a safe uh, self service one? So um, I had one more story, but I'll maybe I'll tell you guys another time instead. Uh, so I want to say thanks for uh, your talk. If you guys are suffering from these issues, you're not alone. Um, let's uh, let's talk. And I got some books here. So um, they told me I need to make this interactive. So maybe I'll ask like if you can condense it down to like 20 or 30 seconds. Give me like your biggest 
craziest operational failure? It could be crazy or it could just be personal. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? Right here, he hand shot up and he read the hat right after, right after me. I once had an outage that made national radio. Oh, that's good. I Not ran TV, the, the radio. radio station website for a uh, syndicated radio show. Uh, they had a um, contact us form on the website and uh, the email forwarding broke. Uh, one Monday morning, I just fixed it and flushed the queue and 10,000 emails hit this, uh, hit this personality's inbox that morning and he, he got, uh, got after, why is everybody talking about stuff that happened three weeks ago? Why, why am I getting 10,000 emails? Nice, you're I that brought, guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the unicorn project for you. There you go. That's a good. That's a good. That's the uh, follow-up to the Phoenix project. It's a good one. Who's next? I know you and the. Uh, back there. Are you got, you got the microphone? All right. I'll keep this one really short. One time, I put two firewalls in standby mode, and then drove very fastly to the data center. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Who's going? Or over there, either one. Uh, when I was working at BYU, one t there's one database that holds all the student information, and it wasn't accepting any connections, so no one on campus could do anything. They're college kids; they're not doing anything, anyways. <laughs> You're the hero, and actually, in that one. I was setting up a CI/CD pipeline, and instead of using a dot for the current directory, I used a slash and wiped out our root. So thankfully, we had a snapshot that was an hour old, so we were able to recover it, but that was a bad day. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm looking for a job. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anybody else back there? I'll go back there, sorry. We had a, had a someone tell me the other day about a, uh, they had this performance issue like almost every night. This, this uh, a core router in their kind of legacy data center would reboot, and uh, they couldn't figure out what was going on. So they're watching the uh, the video on the uh, who's going in and out. And they noticed it was the cleaning crew, and uh, they came every third night or whatever it was, and they were literally unplugging the router to plug in the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and this happened for like five or six nights in a row, or, you know, five or six multiple weeks, five or six you know three week increments in a row until they figured it out. So sorry. Okay. Uh, I applied a firewall rule to block everything, including ARP. Uh, this was a Brazil data center, so I had to call remote hands to have them uh, roll back one. It was great. In Portuguese? Was that? In Portuguese? Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Was one? Yeah. I didn't cause this one, but it happened while I was there. Uh, there was a red button that was the emergency power off for the entire data center. Uh -oh. And they were giving a tour, and they said, this is the button powered it off. And from that point on, there's a plastic cover over it. So. That's a 15 cent remediation, right? Uh, we exercised our business continuity plan that day. It was an excellent test. Wow, well, that's good times. Um, this one was pretty recent. It wasn't too serious, but we had a mitigation for a, a small disk issue that we were having that was removing everything in a directory that was older in a certain amount of time. Um, but the script that I was using to remove everything in that directory was on that directory. So after that small certain amount of time, it removed itself and it stopped working. Nice. We got it. Are there developers in the room? They're like, what a bunch of bozos. No. <laughs> so this one wasn't me and it's building off the one a little while ago, but also be careful with the dot dot slash. Huh. And this was for a company that didn't believe in source control. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. That's brutal. Let me just get him right there. That one, you're next. Uh, so this was a, a mentor of mine, and at a smaller company, um, most of our clients would pay us for support in it. In most cases, something comes up, they're like, we need you to fix our data. So we're doing these things in production, so to speak. No, not so to speak. We were doing updates to their live databases in SQL, and my mentor ran his update statement on their mortgage information and forgot the where clause and wiped the whole thing out. Um, they're like, oh, it's no big deal. We have a backup company that's doing these backups. They call their backup company and uh, they hadn't done a backup in six months. Uh, brutal. It's like FDIC insurance. Is it really there? <laughs> I don't know. 
Oh, sorry. And then uh, you're, sorry, I forgot. We are out of books, just FYI. Uh, sorry, everyone. Oh, darn. Sorry, I forgot you're next. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Uh, just years ago, I worked for a small company. I was the IT department. Oh. And I had to go in on a Saturday and fix something on one of their systems. Took my son with me. He was three or four. I was getting work done. He seen the main computer, just a little, it was a desk site computer sitting there. Red switch, off. Shut everything down for the company <laughs> until I figured out what it was. Nice. So don't take your kids into the, into the computer room. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, so One we upgraded uh, our Windows 2012 server to Windows 2019 and didn't test any of our outbound API connections. And uh, research groups couldn't get um, grant funding for about a week. I was working on an SMS chatbot system, and um, I coded it specifically. If you didn't understand the command, it would text back, you know, here's the instructions to help. And so I was testing it, and I put in a test phone number that um, was another IVR system, and it replied back with a similar message saying, I don't understand your message, you know, here's the help text. And so a million messages later, we um, changed that number. <laughs> That's great. All right, we've got time for one more. Anybody? Uh one more here, then we're. Then it's Christmas morning because it's 4:45. So, you know. So I was a data center in charge for a telecom company, and during the billing process, when it was running, one of the DBA, he used the GUI tools and dropped the temporary table space. So whatever was running on, they all were halted and gone. So I have a follow-up question. We did recover it, but in these kind of scenarios, uh, Damon, yeah. uh, what do you think uh, is more important, like put up the fire first and try the root cause and then fix the root cause first? Do you have any uh, uh, suggestions for these kind of scenarios? I like, think put out the fire first. That's put up the fire first. That's the best career, uh, <laughs> that's the best career <laughs> advice I have. Yeah. Right. would be like, so, wait a minute, let's let those customers hang for a while while we figure out what's really Yeah, what's yeah. Really so happening. it's skills. I would say skills gap is one of the problems I have seen in uh, those kind of scenarios. Yeah, definitely so. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right.